evening and welcome to the 2014 Shakespeare Slam, coming to you tonight from Kerner Hall in downtown Toronto. My name is Edward Durrani. I'll be your host this evening for the pre-show and for the intermission show before we hand it over to our debaters on stage for the first act. It's my pleasure to kick off this event, uh, which kicks off not only Shakespeare's birthday, but all of our forum events. It's a way for us to expand your experience at the Stratford uh, Festival, and we do that with over 200 uh, events uh, entitled the Forum. Um, we, uh, we, we can't wait to, to host you in Stratford this summer. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Anita Gaffney right now. Anita is our Executive Director and uh, she is uh, coming to join me. She's going to talk a little bit, we're going to talk a little bit about our season. Anita, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Um, can you give us a little overview of the, the season, about the 2014 season that's in Stratford? Yeah, it's just seconds away from happening practically. Uh, we had our first preview on Monday of Crazy For You mm -hmm. and it just blew the roof off the place. We've got 12 productions in 2014. The theme of the season is madness, minds pushed to the edge. Mm -hmm. And we're exploring madness in a lot of different ways, through things like King Lear, through Man of La Mancha. Um, uh, you know, there's a whole range of ways to explore madness, um, uh, you know, around war, around society. Um, and it's also Shakespeare's 450th birthday this year. So we've got a number of things that we're doing to celebrate Shakespeare's birthday, including five Shakespeare productions in the season. Excellent. Now, uh, I myself, am, I'm really excited about a couple of the uh, Shakespeare productions, just because they don't come around in the canon so much. Uh, the two of them being King John and Antony and Cleopatra. But do you have any favorites that you're maybe looking forward to? That's kind of the question, like, who's your favorite child? Yeah, sort of I know. question, yeah. Um, I'm really looking forward to King Lear. Um, you know, Colm Fior is such a versatile actor. Uh, he's doing King Lear, and then he's doing a restoration comedy later in the season in Beau Stratagem. And then this month, he's starring in Spider-Man 2. Um, so this is a guy that can do anything. So I'm really looking forward to seeing how he approaches King Lear. And King Lear is such a, a touching story. You know, um, we've all had parents um, who uh, have traveled through uh, age and through um, experience. And um, I think we can relate to what he's going through with his children. And although it's you know a hard play to see and it's emotional, um, it's fun to go on that journey and I'm looking forward to that. I'm also looking forward to Man of La Mancha. I think uh, Tom Rooney um, as Don Quixote is just going to be wonderful and the set design looks really cool. It's really, uh, you know, the motif of the... Um, it's, still, it's, it's operatic in scale, it is isn't operatic, it? yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I'm really looking forward to that, but it's, it's hard to pick. Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit maybe about um, Alice through the Looking Glass, because mm -hmm. that might be something that is uh, going to interest a lot of our, our, our families that are coming yeah, to Stratford this yeah, season. Yeah. And um, it might be kind of interesting to know that this is the second book in the Alice se uh, yeah, series, right? Yes. It's not, it's not uh, in Wonderland, it is through the Looking Glass. Yeah, so yeah. It, it's, it only has one character that overlaps, but mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's going to be a fantastic tale, and it's being directed by Gillian Kiley. Yeah, Gillian Kiley is the artistic director at the National Art Center, and she's taken a really inventive approach to this production. Um, they um, have wonderful sets, but they move on bicycles, and um, they've created uh, a spoiler alert, but Humpty Dumpty um, breaks open at one point, and they've invented the insides of Humpty, the Humpty Dumpty. The yoke. The yoke, which is so cool. Um, but yes, Alice Through the Looking Glass is a very episodic piece where she's going th to meet all these people, the Red Queen and the White Queen and the White Knight, and um, she has all of these adventures with these people. And so it's very fast-paced, great for families, um, and as I said, really inventive. So l let's have a little talk about uh, perhaps um, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. Mm -hmm. We've got two versions of it this year. Um, one is a four-hander uh, happening at the Masonic Temple, mm -hmm. and the other one is uh, on our festival stage. And two vastly different shows. Yeah, the one on the main stage is set in a park-like setting. So all through this winter, 
um, in this harsh, harsh winter that we had. There was nothing like going into the festival theater and stepping on the grass on the stage. Um, it's really neat. It's a, it's the idea of it is that it's a wedding reception, and um, at the wedding reception they put on a performance of A Midsummer Night's Dream, and it's directed by Chris Abraham, who's a Seminovich Award yeah, winner, yeah. very gifted director, um, and I think he's going to get some great performances, a lot of fun. And then the other one is a chamber version with just four characters. Polar and opposite. Total opposite, and it's directed by Peter Sellers, who's a really renowned uh, international director who's joining us this year. So it'll be really interesting to be able to compare the two. Now, you know, uh, along with all the plays that go on on our, on our stages, uh, audiences can also join us in a number of different events. We have uh, archive tours, warehouse tours. Um, can you maybe talk a little bit about uh, how uh, anybody coming to the festival might expand their experience by coming to see something else at the festival or maybe something else in the town of Stratford? Well, I was born and raised in Stratford, so this is the insider story, but I think <laughs> lots of people have discovered it. You know, the swans are absolutely iconic Stratford, and one of my favorite things to do is to just go to Zares and pick up a picnic and sit down by the river and let the swans chase you around for a little while. Um, it's also fun to rent boats and mm -hmm. be able to tour up and down the river. Um, and with Stratford Summer Music, they have a barge that rides up and down the, the river and plays music, and it's a wonderful, it's idyllic, magical setting. Um, but uh, there's also things like the chocolate trail. We're very fortunate in Stratford mm -hmm. that we That's have right. a number of yummy chocolate shops. Um, and uh, uh, we've got also a number of bookstores and, you know, walking our Victorian downtown is a really f nice thing to do as well. So there's plenty of things for you to do in Stratford when you come uh, that would not only uh, enhance your understanding of the plays with all the uh, forum events, 200 plus forum events, uh, expand your experience that way, but also uh, right on our grounds. Um, and also in the town itself. Now, maybe if I could take just 30 seconds and, and talk about uh, the ad idea of, you know, we see one aspect of the theater uh, when we come to see a play, yeah. but we've got uh, about a thousand different employees backstage making all of this happen. Yeah, um, one of my favorite places to go is the prop shop. Um, I find that it's so inspiring to see what they're able to invent. Um, you know, in Alice Through the Looking Glass, there's a chess game that moves remotely, and they had to figure out how to move those chess pieces yeah, without yeah. an actor moving them. Um, the wardrobe also, you know, to look at the design sketches and then to see what they're able to create out of those design sketches, is it's absolutely uh, remarkable, and I think it's a real differentiator for the Stratford Festival. And um, there's hundreds of people that work behind the scenes to, to make the festival yeah. happen, and I don't think people realize that every show is built from the ground up. That's right, that's right. Well, listen. There is a palpable energy that is building here right now as we get ready to get into the, uh, the house and start this Shakespeare Slam and the debate that's going to happen. I'm going to let Anita get back uh, so that you can get to your seat. Thank you so much for Great. joining Thank us. Thank you. Thanks and we'll so see you afterwards. Thank you. Thanks. For us back at home, uh, I wish you were here to join us. Um, uh, we hope that you uh, join us uh, online for the, uh, the debate that's going to be happening. If you have any questions, uh, go visit our website um, and uh, check out all the different forum events. There's a tab that is uh, called Forum, and it has everything that's listed, every event before every show that you could possibly come and enjoy. So listen, uh, once again, Edward Duraney. I'm uh, coming to you live from Kerner Hall, and we are going to the stage. Sorry. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Shakespeare Slam. My name is Anthony Cimolino. I'm the artistic director of the Stratford Festival. And I want to thank each and every one of you for coming out tonight 
and uh, sharing in this evening. And I've got to tell you, having watched all of the sound checks and everything else that's gone on this stage this afternoon, you are in for a treat tonight. So we are here together April 23rd because we're here to celebrate a birthday. And what a birthday it is. It's a 450th birthday. That is a lot of candles. <laughs> it is Shakespeare, William Shakespeare's 450th. If uh, little Billy was running around today, uh, he'd have a bit of wear and tear on him, but no doubt new knees, new hips, you know, he'd keep going. Uh, can you imagine if he had never turned his hand to writing or had never been born? Our language would be different. The theater certainly would be different because it was Shakespeare who took up the mantle of the theater after the Greeks, of course, and, and made it a pulpit and made it a crucible for discussion of ideas and, and uh, emotions. And it changed the course of the theater ever since. And they are all the arts, actually. And if Harold Bloom's to be believed that uh, Shakespeare helped us define what it is to be human, then perhaps we would be different if he hadn't turned his hand to writing. So uh, we will have a chance, all of us together, to sing happy birthday later. But uh, William, happy birthday. The other reason we get together on this day is to launch the Stratford Festival Forum and the Stratford Festival season for another year. The 2014 season, as you saw, is upon us. And uh, we opened, uh, had our first preview of Crazy For You, which was met with incredible rounds of applause and joy uh, this past Monday. And this is the first event of the festival's forum. The Stratford Festival Forum is a true festival within our festival. It's over 200 different events that take place during the course of the season, the whole year. And they range from music concerts, film screenings, uh, wonderfully accomplished people who come and talk to us, debates, comedy nights, that examine the themes that are in the season and with each one of these plays. And this year, I've put together a playbill that is centered around the idea of madness and minds pushed to the edge. Why? Because I see that in our lives, we're all faced with so many different stressors that we, we, we deal with. And the stress in our own personal lives is difficult. But on the stage, we watch it happening to others. It becomes the stuff of great comedies. It becomes the stuff of great tragedies. It makes for great drama. For instance, minds pushed to the edge. Minds pushed to the edge by family? Well, there's King Lear and there's Noel Coward's hay fever. Minds pushed to the edge by war. There's Breck's mother courage and her children, and also King John. Minds pushed to the edge by love. There's two different productions of Midsummer Night's Dream that we have this year, one with the incomparable Peter Sellers, and the other with our own Chris Abrahams directing, one on the main stage and one in a chamber version uh, in a new space that we've uh, created in Stratford. And also uh, pushed to the edge by love in Antony and Cleopatra, and also Crazy for You, Minds pushed to the edge by money in both stratagem, by sexuality in Christine, the girl king. And minds even pushed over the edge when the mind and the imagination begins to take over and help us cope by seeing things that are incredibly new in Man of La Mancha and Alice Through the Looking Glass, where we envision entire new worlds. <clears throat> yes, I, that felt like sort of like a toast moment, you know? Either there's toast or I'm having a stroke. Um, we are live streaming this event tonight, so I want to welcome all the people from around the world that are joining us here to watch the debate and the festivities that we're taking on tonight. Welcome, everybody. Now, I just want to tell you about just a couple of the form events that are happening this summer. Uh, and there, as I said, they're a whole range and they happen throughout the season, so you can pick them out as you're looking at what you want to come and see. For instance, on June 8th, we have an event that is about war and the impact on children called And Her Children. And on June 8th, we'll have Romeo Dallaire, we'll have Dr. Isaldine Abulash from the Daughters for Life Foundation, we'll, and Dr. Samantha Nutt from War Child Canada, all together talking about this topic. We have Margaret Trudeau joining us. Margaret Trudeau will be speaking to us on July 20th about her own personal journey that led her to become an advocate for mental health awareness. We have the ARC Ensemble. The ARC Ensemble are the teachers and the artists of the Royal Conservatory that we have here, and they're going to be doing a concert that combines music from the First World War with, uh, with different writings. And so 
it's amazing how powerful words and music together can be. They did a number of concerts last year and they were just unforgettable. And we have the always insightful Camille Paglia, who's going to be coming and she'll be speaking about the dark women of Shakespeare. And if you ever had a chance to hear her speak, she's really riveting. Um, all right, now I am smelling toast. Um, hold it down back there. They're clearly like uh, beginning the debate without us back there. All right, tonight, we're going to take a little bit more time to explore the relationship between madness and creativity, madness and art. You know, we've often heard about the mad poet or the tortured artist, and that image has captivated Western civilization for hundreds and hundreds of years. Madness, of course, internationally plays out against many different cultural backgrounds where it can mean all sorts of different things to different groups. But while we think of artists, some of them being mad, um, we'd be loath to say that all artists have mental health issues or that anybody who has a mental health issue should be an artist. However, Shakespeare did say the lunatic, the lover, and the poet are of imagination, all compact. And Aristotle did declare that no excellent soul is exempt from a mixture of madness. So we can see that through history, creative offerings from generation of artists who've lived with various conditions that we would recognize in today's terms would be, uh, that would be deemed as mental disorders did some incredible work. Vincent van Gogh, Jackson Pollock, Sylvia Plath, Ezra Pound, Beethoven, Nijinsky, Tolstoy, Isaac Newton. And that's not even mentioning actors. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. It's hard to imagine our world today without the accomplishments of those individuals that I mentioned. So maybe we should take a moment and think about their own inner lives and what they went through and uh, how that impacted upon their work and the great testament they left us of human capacity. So the resolution we have before us in this debate, be it resolved that madness is an inherent part of the artistic process. This is a team debate and we're going to combine both artistic and medical points of view in this equation. We've combined two fabulous teams together. On the pro side, we have Paul Gross and Lisa Brown. And on the con side, we have Stephen Page and Dr. David Goldblum. Now, I'm going to introduce all four of these titans. They are going to wait. We have them chained up back there. And then they're going to come out together. And at that point, you can express your great admiration uh, for their, uh, their work. Let me begin by introducing Paul Gross. Paul has a very long history with the Stratford Festival. Did you know that Paul began work at Stratford when he was only 16 in our box office? In 1986, he became our playwright in residence. And then in 2000, he played the Danish Prince. He played Hamlet for us in what was a critically acclaimed performance. Many of you, of course, will know him as Constable Benton Fraser in the multi-award winning show Due South. Uh, more recently, he's appeared in Toronto in No Coward's Private Lives. He's quite an accomplished man. He's a producer. He's been a director. He is, of course, an actor. He is a champion of the Canadian theater. And quite frankly, as a nation, we're lucky to have him. But it was for his portrayal of the overly mentally wrought, wrought uh, artistic director Jeffrey Tennant in the film series Slings and Arrows that we thought to invite him here with us today. <laughs> All right, joining Paul is Lisa Brown. And Lisa Brown is herself extremely accomplished. She's the founder and the artistic director of Workman Arts. And it's an arts and mental health company known internationally for its artistic collaborations and also for its research on the impact of the arts on the quality of life of people living with mental illness and addiction. She started work on the front lines of men medical profession at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, where she recognized the need for an artistic outlet for her clients. And starting in 1987, she began a theater company with eight members a very, of limited theatrical training, and it has since grown exponentially. Workman Arts has evolved into a professionally recognized multidisciplinary arts organization with over 230 active members. 
It's produced over 20 original full-length Canadian plays, 19 Rendezvous with Madness film festivals, 10 annual Being Seen art exhibitions. And by the way, and this is a plug and an important one, she said they have, she, have, she has a piece of work on Workman Arts that they're extremely proud of that's gonna take place May 2nd and May 3rd at the Ada Slate Theater. It's called Third Eye Looming. It's a multidisciplinary journey through madness. And it's going to tour around the world, but it's starting here and you can take it in May 2nd and May 3rd. So that is a very, very strong team on the pro side, but let's see who we've matched them up against. On the con side, we have Stephen Page. And Stephen uh, has had a long relationship with Stratford. Uh, it, it, because his parents brought him when he was very young. In 2005, he wrote music for my production of As You Like It. We've since collaborated on a three different productions. He's become a great friend. Many of you, of course, will know him from his work with the Bare Naked Ladies, where the music, both as lead singer and as a writer, the music that he put together had such sparkle, has such wit. It shows a real uh, driving intelligence, but also, Songs like Brian Wilson, which he wrote at the age of 19, are so haunting, and they are about battling mental illness. Um, Stephen, since leaving the Bare Naked Ladies, has launched out many exciting collaborations with such artists as Stephen Duffy, releasing two solo albums and, and a single, as well as touring on his own and with the Art of Time Ensemble. And this coming fall, he's now in the studio. He was in the studio today recording a new album that will be coming out, so please watch out for that. Um, he, we are very lucky to have Stephen with us today because he's become an active spokesperson for mental health community. And it'll be great to have him sharing his thoughts and his experiences, and both as a debater and also in the second half, he'll be performing. And I tell you, we cannot have a smarter, a kinder, or a more enormously talented person with us. Finally, to round out this group, again, on the con side on the question, we have Dr. David Goldblum. Now, David, you know, is a bit of a slouch. Rhodes Scholar, educated at Harvard and Oxford. He's a professor of psychiatry at the University of Toronto. He's currently the senior medical advisor for CAMH. He maintains an active clinical practice. He's also, in his spare time, the chair of the Mental Health Commission of Canada. And he has just completed, after many years on the Stratford Festival Board, a two-year term as our chair. He's really, really amazing. Um, the great shame about David is that he's a wonderful pianist and he could have been a damn fine actor. <laughs> I don't know why he had to go do those other things. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our debaters, Paul Gross, Lisa Brown, Stephen Page, and Dr. David Goldblum. All the best. Well, the second best. <laughs> well, it's civilized so far. Uh, it was trash talk already. <laughs> uh oh. All right. We are going to give each one of these people six minutes to present their case. Then we will have an open discussion, a moderated discussion. If you desperately want a question to be asked, we will entertain shouted questions from the floor. We're going to make it that kind of crazy and loose. But uh, let's begin by allowing them to speak. Paul will speak first, followed by Stephen, followed by Lisa, followed by David. At 30 seconds before the six minutes, there will be a very powerful bell that will ring. And then after that, the music starts playing, the hook comes out, you know the well, deal. Well, Anthony, you said almost everything I was going to say, so I think I should be, you know, <clears throat> well under six. <laughs> Go for it, Paul. Okay. Uh, I have a preface here which is really more of a caveat. Uh, I have no authority to speak on the subject of mental health and I have no intention to do so. Uh, anything I have to say here tonight really is restricted to the artistic process insofar as I understand it. Okay, that said, I think I need, need a second. I'm going to get into character quickly. Okay, that feels better. Um, I would like to start... <clears throat> I'll start, if I could, with some words of uh, Antony's already quoted, written 400 years ago by Shakespeare, the man, I think, who has furnished us with what's essentially 
our secular liturgy, and they bear repeating. They're from Midsummer Night's Dream in a scene with Theseus and Hippolyta where he says, the lunatic, the lover, and the poet are of imagination all compact. And I think more than anyone before or since Shakespeare understood the extraordinarily febrile relationship between altered states and creativity and madness. Uh, four centuries later, not very far from where we're all gathered here tonight, Marshall McLuhan observed that we look at the present through a rearview mirror. We march backwards into the future. And in a related thought, he said, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is an hallucinating idiot. <laughs> because he sees what no one else does, things that to everyone else are not there. Artists have the power to see their environments as they really are." Unquote. Now these two thoughts, madness and the ability to see, are twinned in the artistic process. The capacity to see and hear the present is the artist's role in this world. This is our job. And the facility to do so involves a kind of madness. It is a non-rational facility, or as Theseus says, it is the ability to apprehend more than cool reason ever comprehends. It's an imaginative ability that requires the temporary loss of the proper self, the consciousness, the ego, the governor, or as Kurt Vonnegut, I think, once put it, he said he could only write when he could put his big brain to sleep. The artist enters a state of madness, and he roams in a landscape that is revelatory in nature. And when I use the word revelatory, I don't mean this in some kind of woolly new age thing. It is actually the terribly accurate description of what artists do. I don't know of a single artist who can say where their ideas come from. They just happen, as if voices appear to them and are revealed to them in the ether. In that way, it might, and it might seem a little bit odd, uh, given their very fractious nature, but I think religion and art have always been very closely allied. And as far back as we can look, this inspiring madness has been central to the artistic process. In prehistorical societies, there is almost no daylight between the shaman, the madman, and the storyteller. And the ancient Greeks codified this, the nature of this creative spirit with the nine muses who both protected arts and inspired the artists who made the art. And the author of the first great poetic works of Western culture, Homer, appealed to the muses in the first lines of both the Iliad and the Odyssey in which he wrote, tell me, O muse, of that imperious hero who traveled far and wide after he'd sacked the famous city of Troy. But jump ahead a millennium and you have John Milton's Paradise Lost, and again, the opening lines of which are, of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree whose mortal taste brought death into our world and all our woe with loss of Eden, Sing, heavenly muse, thou from the first wast present. Jump ahead to today, and you have an English rock band known simply as Muse. <laughs> no, no, no. That might seem like a bit of a declension to go from <clears throat> Homer to Milton to a band from Devon, but the point is that throughout history, artists have invoked outside help to achieve a state of receptivity, a kind of unconscious madness to reduce the proper self so they can receive inspiration and tell our stories accurately. Revelation is the state and madness is the tool. And precisely because it is a tool, it must be managed. It's not enough to be able to receive this inspiration, you have to be able to do something with it. And that's where the big brain comes back in. The artist roams and is inspired, then he or she must return their big brain to the governor's chair so that the inspiration can be edited and shaped and fashioned into something that we, through our rearview mirrors, are able to receive. And art is dangerous. These states are dangerous. And for many, they're very difficult to manage. And God knows the history is littered with shattered bodies of artists who have entered the state and been unable to return. Now, I had a brush with this when I played Hamlet, as Anthony said some years ago at Stratford. And, uh, Hamlet is an odd part because it's often said that it's not a part you play, it's more a part that plays you, which is very true. It consumes almost your entire life, every waking and sleeping moment. For me, anyway, it was almost two years, and getting ready for it and playing it. <clears throat> and I started to lose my mind while I was doing it, and it came sort of in three stages. The first, I became wildly paranoid about everybody in the cast. Um, <laughs> I was pretty sure that they were all, they all were doing, going to do something to me. And then I started to have these hallucinations, which 
were mostly oral in nature, although sometimes I did actually see Shakespeare. I feel like I have this extraordinarily weird relationship with him because I saw him when he first said, what a piece of work is man. And to me, it was entirely true. But the oral hallucinations were really weird because I would be on stage and people would be saying something. And I, know the, I knew the audience was hearing the actual lines, but they were saying a very different thing to me. Um, and this extended out past the stage even into the, oh Christ. All right, I'll hurry up. Into the grocery store. Give you an store. extra 30 seconds. I, mean, like, I didn't even trust cashiers. And then eventually what really frightened me is that I was, uh, I started to black out. And, and I mean, not faint, but just disappear entirely. And it got particularly bad at one point where I was gone for, I don't know how long. I know I, I did To Be or Not To Be. I did the nunnery scene and a couple scenes on either side of it. And I have absolutely no recollection of it. The person who saved me was really, I thought I was having a nervous collapse of some description. And Brent Carver actually saved me because he had played Hamlet sometime before me. And I, I, he would check in with me. And I, I said, I, I'm, I thought I'm losing my mind. He said, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm blacking out. He said, oh, yes, it's awful, isn't it? <laughs> I stopped now. You can't make this stuff up. <laughs> um, thanks, Paul. As a matter of fact, the cashiers are still upset with you. <laughs> All right. Uh, so that was an artist speaking on the pro side that uh, mental illness is an integral part of the artistic process. Now let's hear an artist speak on the con side. Stephen Page, ladies and gentlemen. I did not say that. First of all, I'm, I, our statement is that madness is an essential part of the artistic process. Um, I want to make that, that clear and uh, distinct from mental illness because when we use the word madness, what is it that we mean? I mean, when I think of madness, I think um, of a decent but not, it's not the most significant of the two-tone ska bands of England of the early 80s. <laughs> some decent songs, but not that essential to the creative process. Um, by the way, I, I know I'm, not, I'm not, in a debate format, I'm not supposed to be responding to Paul. He said he had no authority, but that shit was fucked up. <laughs> At the end there, they're blacking out? That's crazy. Uh, <laughs> um, I think the, the concept of madness versus the concept of mental illness or mental health are often different things. And when we, when we discuss what is mad and what is essential to the artistic process, uh, it's very different from the debilitating, often, uh, um, effects of the struggle with mental health. Uh, I've struggled with it a lot uh, over, over the years, some quite famously. Um, didn't get me reelected back into my band, but you know, <laughs> they got their own. Anyways, um, <laughs> you know, we we all have our struggles. You know, there are things everybody experiences: the ultimate lows and the ultimate highs in life. Absolute euphoria is something that is universal, and that we do not need to be William Blake in order to ex uh, experience it. And absolute lows the loss of a parent or a loved one, heartbreak, our disappointment, anger at oneself, are intrinsic to the human experience. Those are things that we all can experience together, and that's what makes art relatable. The artist can tap into those things in moments when there is a moment of transcendence, when we let go of the rational mind, and I often talk about my rational mind and my sick mind and how they're often fighting each other. And the sick mind will win sometimes. But the sick mind does not create the great art. The sick mind sometimes later will inform the art. But the experiences that we have as humans that are, are extreme, uh, we do not need to be ill in order to investigate them. In order to investigate those things, we need to be observant and awake and aware. And that middle line, if you're looking at 
someone's mental health is doing that, for example, as, uh, as some people are, that middle line is, for me, where I can actually see the good and the bad, the up and the down, the dark and the light. In the most manic periods of my life, there, uh, there's no judging what the quality of work I would do uh, would be uh, or, or whether I would actually finish it. In, in the darkest parts, I wouldn't get anything done. I'd be lying on the floor, covered up in the sheets. There's, there, there's nothing uh, romantic about that. It's destructive. It's painful to other people around you. Nobody needs to be working with an artist, an actor, a director, uh, a writer who is completely unreliable because of their, their own struggle, uh, who is completely... Um, uh, uh, unpredictable in that way, and often we use the the ideal of the or the, the romantic vision of the the tortured artist as an excuse for bad behavior. Uh, the, the bad behavior sometimes can come as a result of mental illness. But if I was to throw this podium over, which would be awesome, um, <laughs> but I would use I, oh I'm so sorry right afterwards. Um, uh, it would be very uncomfortable, and you think, well, that was kind of weird, and I don't know if I liked that guy, but that was kind of cool. But, um, but if you had to work with me at the same time, I, that would create a dynamic that was not healthy. Um, those kinds of, those kinds of, of uh, sets of behavior, you can't, we can't use our health struggles as an excuse for that. So what happens just to those of us who are constantly battling our own brains? is that's an extra workload. Um, and sometimes I feel thankful that I can actually get work done on top of that and actually get bills paid down on time and get songs finished. Um, I feel like at the end of the day, if Van Gogh were not, uh, if we were to look back and let's say I was able to diagnose him because I have that authority, um, <laughs> If he were not mentally ill, what we would have was an artist with two ears and a hell of a lot more paintings. <laughs> and paintings that were equally good. I don't think that's what made him good or made any artist particularly good, but I think the good artist is the one... Do, am, did you guys hear that too? <laughs> I think, the good, I think the good artist is the one who can punch through that, who can, who can punch through the, the most difficult parts in order to get the work done and express themselves um, and maybe in touch with their own soul. But that is something that is available, I think, to anybody who is of an artistic spirit, mad or not. Did you hear that ringing? I mean, that's just embarrassing, Stephen. All right, let's see. Lisa, of course, has much more integrity. She will pay attention to the bells. Lisa Brown. So I believe there's an inextricable link between madness, which I define as mental illness, and the arts. Scholars have been obsessed with the notion of the tortured artist. Plato said it well when he said, creativity is divine madness, a gift from God. Aristotle concurred, no genius, no great genius was genius without a mixture of insanity. Consider Seneca who said, no great genius has ever existed without some, some touch of madness. So I say, where there is smoke, there is fire. So please understand, to be an artist, you don't necessarily need to be mentally ill, and to have a mental illness does not make you an artist. As with physical illness, there's lots of different types of mental illnesses, depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, obsessive compulsive disorder, blah, 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 blah. However, these illnesses are either acute or they're chronic. They're either temporary or they're permanent. My arguments are based on three things. One, my own personal experience. Two, the research, and three, the most provocative, the work by a leading archaeologist, Dr. David Whitley. My work, as Anthony talked to you about, um, I was at Queen Street when I met artists who completely inspired me with their artistry and their vision. I founded a company in 87 to support these artists, and over the past 26 years, I have worked with over a thousand artists. And I say privilege 
because I was, I've been granted access to these artists' worlds and their work. They are gifted. Their insights into the human condition is at times staggering. The breadth and depth of their ideas excite and invigorate me. Many seem to be spiritually connected to something larger than what exists here on Earth, and they see things that I don't, or I miss, or I don't want to see. They show me life in its nakedness, when it's the most beautiful, and when it's absolutely devastating. I would have never started Workman Arts and never met these artists. I would probably be living a shallow, if I had never met these artists, I would probably be living a shallow existence, unaware of the things that I cannot see. In the scientific research of today, I'm going to uh, have my colleague David Johnson, uh, David Johnson, <laughs> David Goldblum, um, uh, <laughs> talk to you about uh, a Swedish study, which is really exciting um, in terms of the link between creativity and mental illness. But I will say um, that the studies by Jameson, Andreasen, and Ludwig reveals findings that are that show a high propensity of creativity within individuals who have a various, type, various types of mental illness. The medical establishment dismisses these findings on the grounds that they involve small, highly specialized samples with weak and inconsistent methodologies and a strong dependence on the subjective and the anecdotal accounts. David will tell you about the latest research and perhaps the most comprehensive study to date that's come out of Sweden. And I'll give you a taste of what that is. Creative types are thought to be more likely to suffer from mental illness, such as bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. Creative types are also more likely to have family members being treated for schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, anorexia, and autism. This research looked at 40 years worth of data from Sweden's health registry, looking at anonymous records of 1.2 million patients and their relatives. David will continue on talking about that. I want to tell you about the most, the most provocative argument that I think I can make today. Dr. David Whitley, the author of Cave Paintings and the Human Spirit, The Origin of Creativity and Belief. David Whitley is one of the world's leading experts on cave paintings. Drawings from his decades of archaeological research and pulling from literature as diverse as neuropsychology, anthropology, geochemistry, and religion, gave a TED talk on December 27, 2013. You should look at it, it's really inspiring. He states that Homo sapiens first appeared approximately 40,000 years ago, and that cave art had been discovered as early as 36,000 years ago. His questions to on the TED talk was, how do we explain the sudden flourishing of artistic creativity at such a high level, and who created it, and why was none seen ever before that? Well, there's an ongoing debate between the experts, the archaeologists versus the evolutionary psych psychologists. The archaeologists specializing in prehistoric cave paintings have argued that the visionary rituals of shamans led to the creative expression and consider shamanism to be the earliest known form of religion. By contrast, evolutionary psychologists view, in their eyes, the wild and ecstatic trances of shamans were forms of aberrant behavior. In other words, mental illness. Whitley proposes a radically new and original theory that weds these two seemingly warring camps from two separate disciplines. He states, number one, there were shamans everywhere who were the artists, the poets, dancers, singers, painters. Two, shamans were widely considered to be mentally ill. When we talk about modern psychiatry and look at diagnostic criteria, it would tell us that the shamans suffered from mood disorders, bipolar, unipolar, schizoaffective. I say draw your own conclusions. I want to, I want to leave you with um, a quote. In, uh, Sylvia Nassar, uh, in her biography, wrote on John Nash, the mathematician. Quote, someone asked Nash, who suffered with delusions, how he could believe that extraterrestrials were sending him messages or that he was being recruited by aliens from outer space to save the world. Because, Nash said, the ideas I had about supernatural beings came to me the same way that my mathematical ideas did. So I took them seriously. Thank you.
That was very good. It sounds like we're starting to get somewhere. That's good. Okay, David Goldblum, Modern Psychiatry, help us out here. Thank you, and first, a, thank you. First, a public service announcement for anybody who was worried. I want to reassure you that no sharks were injured in the making of Antony's suit. Uh, now, you've already heard a great deal about the topic of tonight's debate, but uh, I... You lose a minute for that. Okay. Did you say I had 45 minutes or four to five minutes? Seconds, okay. David, seconds. All right. Uh, I want to assure you that the plural of opinion is not truth. And the reality is that truth lies on either side of the resolution that we are facing tonight. So for those of you in the audience old enough to remember that Mint commercial with the golden drop of Retson and the arguing identical twins, the announcer said, stop, you're both right. And that's in fact uh, an element of truth to tonight's debate. And really we could be arguing either side of us, any one of the four of us. And so to quote my hero, Groucho Marx, I would say, these are my principles. If you don't like them, I have others. Uh, so. <laughs> Let me, we've already heard the famous quote from uh, the dream about the lunatic, the lover, and the poet, but in, in the wake of Shakespeare, there were other people, other great writers who made contributions. John Dryden, the restoration poet and playwright, wrote that great wits are sure to madness near allied, and thin partitions do their bounds divide. Lord Byron stated it much more plainly. He said, we of the craft are all crazy. Some are touched by gaiety, others by melancholy, but we are all touched. And of course, Byron went on to touch a lot of people himself. <laughs> but uh, what has persisted, as Antony pointed out, across the centuries is this romantic vision of the starving mad artist in his garret, writing a symphony, composing a long poem, or writing a play. That's fine as a romantic image, but what does the modern research really tell us? And the modern research began in the 1980s uh, with the work of uh, oops, Nancy Andreasen. And Nancy Andreasen studied 30 writers at the Iowa Writers Workshop, creative writers, and compared them to 30 non-writers, her control group. And what she found was that there was a much higher incidence of mood disorders, depression, bipolar disorder in the creative writers compared to the controls. However, the writers all consistently said that when they were depressed or manic, they were unable to be creative. Their creativity diminished. What was really interesting about that study, and that I'll allude to in the Swedish study, is that compared to the family members of the controls, the family members of those creative writers also had higher incidences of both mood disorder and creativity. Now, as Lisa told you, in the last three years, we've had this massive study from Sweden of 1.2 million people. 300,000 of them had major mental illness, and they looked at them, their first-degree relatives, their second-degree relatives, and their third-degree relatives, as well as all the relatives of the controls. And we could have done this in Canada when we still have the long census, but... Uh, <laughs> What, let me tell you what came out of that study. There was an increase in creative professions among the people with bipolar disorder, but not with schizophrenia and not with depression. But the single most striking thing about this study that Lisa didn't mention is that the greatest degree of creativity was found in the first degree relatives of people with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. That is where creativity resides in the family tree. What's the explanation for this? Are there genes that render us both vulnerable to mental illness and also carry adaptive advantages like creativity? What would madness and creativity have in common? Well, Shelley Carson of Harvard calls this a shared vulnerability. And here are the three key components that could link madness and creativity. The first one is something called latent inhibition. This is something we all do to filter out from conscious awareness stimuli that we see as irrelevant. Some of you are probably already filtering out my talk, <laughs> waiting for the music to start, right? 
But we know that people who are highly creative have reduced latent inhibition. They pick up stimuli that the rest of us miss, and so do people with psychosis. The second component is novelty seeking, the intrinsic motivation to attend to new ideas, very common in creativity, but also in mania and in substance abuse. And finally, neural hyperconnectivity. What is that? Abnormal linking of brain areas that are not usually functionally connected. And we see this in mania, we see it in schizophrenia, and we see it in creativity. Now a little bit of these three fuels the creative process, but too much of it can overwhelm and paralyze the person with madness. Maybe that explains why the first degree relatives of people with mental illness who share some of that genetic pool are so creative. So is there a connection between creativity and madness? Yes, especially when we look at families and possible shared mechanisms. But is madness necessary for creativity? There is absolutely no evidence for that. Kay Jamison, a leading scholar in this area, put it simply a few years ago. Most people who are creative do not have mental illness, and most people who are mentally ill are not unusually creative. I conclude by saying that the truth is that we are better at battling mental illness than we are at bottling creativity. One demands our understanding, our support, and our hope, while the other nourishes our enjoyment and enriches our sense of awe. Thank you. I'd like to invite both teams up to the podium so we can have an open round here of... Uh, um, let me begin by just asking the pro side. Um, you, you made the case, Paul, that you know, through personal experience, uh, you went through a, a madness a process that was akin to madness. And you talk about the visionary uh, needing to go to that place, that dangerous place, in order for uh, art to uh, ensue. And you made some very interesting points, uh, Lisa, about uh, the shamanistic being able to see through. To, but I think the question we all are asking is, is that, as David just mentioned, is that inherent? Does that have to happen? Is it integral to creating art? Or is it just that some people experience those things and despite that, despite the inconvenience of that, manage to create art anyway? Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I do, yeah, I do. I mean, obviously, I think it's integral. I think we're a little bit sort of tripped up. I, I am not proposing, and as I think I said at the beginning, this might be reducing to a kind of semantic distinction. When I say madness, I don't mean mental illness, which is also an enormously wide spectrum, and we, we could try to narrow that down, I suppose. I don't mean a permanently disabled mind. I don't mean somebody who needs to be hospitalized. This is not, and it's not even something that I can talk about. I can talk about madness. Madness in the sense of it being used as a term outside of the medical profession. What it has been understood to mean for quite a long time until more or less recently that we have temporary madness. You are temporarily, everybody experiences that or has experienced that. It is an essential ingredient to being able to get that terrific idea or figure out the hook in that song. Well, then let me, let me and, move to David, just because the, the, you're defining it as, you know, it's a coward's way to hide behind the definition. But anyway, um, so, and you, but no, he no, agreed. No, I'm not no, trying no, to hide behind. I'm trying to be quite specific about what that is. Well, he talked about first and, degree and I would, relevance. I don't have any argument with the, the science. Clearly is not saying that if you were mentally ill, clinically so, that you are necessarily an artist or that you even have a higher propensity to be so. I'm not saying that. But madness to me... I am arguing me, that it is central to the process. But madness, at least to me, would imply a pretty high degree of mental illness, wouldn't it? I mean, I think for most it, of us, it's not just a little bit uh, ability, garden variety mad. It could have, uh, imply the ability to transcend, the ability to have a, 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 a yeah. perspective that is purely an artistic one. And the fact that not everybody sees through the same lens as that artist does not make that artist mentally ill, although some of those artists may be. The, 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 that, that special filter that that artist can see through is what makes them an artist. It's not a product necessarily, I believe, of their illness. I think that is a, a, the trait of an artist in order to be able to 
to process information and uh, reinterpret it for an audience in a way the audience had not expected to hear it. You know, usually in debates, the teams disagree. But, <laughs> but you were the one, you were the one who chose the word madness, which puts Oh, 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 we oh disagree nice. with you. Nice. And, Great. <laughs> now they're in violent agreement. And, I mean, I, I, I've noticed, for example, the word Shakespeare is gone again up there because Shakespeare didn't exist. We all know that he is a product of Castro, the mob, LBJ, and J. Edgar Hoover. <laughs> I should just let David speak, sorry. <laughs> you know, this debate can go any way that we want to if we keep reshaping and redefining the word madness to fit that which might be viewed as an artistic temperament or a special eye. I've stood next to an architect, Bruce Kuabara, when our hospital, CAMH, was initially being redesigned, and Bruce would look out the window at an empty field that we had uh, at uh, 1001 Queen West, and I would look out the, the same window. I'd try to stand in exactly the same position as Bruce Kuabara. Uh, I wasn't dressed in black like he was, but I would, uh, I would sort of rub my chin thoughtfully. I still couldn't see what it was he was seeing because of the creative eye uh, of his architectural uh, gift. But is that madness? I don't think so. When Neil Simon writes his plays and he talks about getting into a transcendent space where he can let the play write itself. When Mozart talks about music coming to him fully formed in a dream, and then when he wakes up, he simply sets it down on paper, fully composed, much to the chagrin of Salieri. Is that madness? I don't think so. I think these are special gifts, but well, I think but madness I, I has think a if, broader you know, meaning. If your accountant showed up and said, I have this magnificent dream, and it came fully formed, all these wonderful magical figures I've come up for you. <laughs> You're probably going to say, this is not an attribute I particularly need. Well, sometimes you do need a creative accountant. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, you know, let, as for two plus two is what? How much do you want it to be? Well, let's, let's, <laughs> let, let's, let's talk about that just for a moment, because you, <laughs> you, you mentioned math and creativity, and of course, you know, there's a strong link between uh, music and drama and uh, and people who are creative with math are, of course, you know, geniuses. Uh, but we don't want it in our accountant. And that, that's the, re the reason for that is, of course, right, because they're doing something practical, something we need. And as Oscar Wilde said, all art is quite useless, right? It has to be useless. It, it, as soon as it has a purpose, then it's a thing. It becomes a product. It becomes something that is done by craftspeople, but not artists. So. <laughs> So if we have grown up... That's not your pitch to Ottawa, is it? Yeah, really. <laughs> I, I was just about to say that I thought... Wait, true, I'm, I, I, I was just about to say that true madness really was anybody who turned their back on the value of art. But, I, but I think it's just, useless. But, but <laughs> if you have grown-ups who spend their lives doing things that will have no inherent use, is... Is that not sort of by definition kind of mad? I can't tell you, <laughs> I cannot tell you that there's, there's no way to quantify the value of art in my life, in saving my life, in moments when I s honestly could have been gone. The, the art, and I think that happens in, my, in minuscule ways to everybody. There are, it could be a, a song, a scene from a movie, a picture, what it, something their kid painted. It doesn't matter. There, there is something about art that has power over the human soul yes, that, is, and has value. that is more useful. This but is, that's uh, not the same thing as having a practical purpose. <clears throat> yes, it's not in, in that same... In, in, uh, and I agree with your point about, the, about, Lisa about Brown craft save person us versus, here. versus artist. Absolutely. Say something smart. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, uh, that we have to look at definitions and vocabulary because we can all interpret madness in a different way. I think it's fascinating that the World Health Organization does not give a definition for mental illness. Hmm. You won't find it. And you won't find it, David. Why won't we find it? Uh, David. Is, this a, <laughs> is there a short quiz? Uh, I don't... <laughs> because we don't look hard enough? No. <laughs> No, it's not there. Oh, okay. because it's not there. That it's was my there. next guess. But they purposely don't 
don't define it. Did David keep it out? He must have kept it out. <laughs> um, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, and I suspect that it's because uh, a lot of cultures um, huh. and religions have different views of madness, different views of of the way we perceive the outside world. I mean, we had shamans, but we have exorcists. We have a whole bunch of otherworldly, supernatural kinds of things that, are, that surround us. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's not defined, because it wouldn't work in, in our world as a whole. But Lisa, let's be careful not to pretend that it doesn't Exist, I'm not saying that right? it doesn't exist. Because when I'm we saying talk we about define shamans, it, I'll give you a modern example of shamanism. When I was training in psychiatry, the uh, teachers from a rabbinical college in Montreal brought in one of their students to the emergency room. And I happened to be on duty. They said, what's the problem? They said, he's like praying nonstop. And I said, well, isn't that sort of what you're training him? <laughs> to? And they said, no, 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 this guy's crazy. Right? And they recognized that there was something that deviated from yes. their norm. It's like when the Hells Angels bring someone in, they say, this guy's really violent, right? <laughs> it's the same thing, all right? I agree, uh, David, I agree. So, but okay. it's, it's also hard for us as, um, uh, sometimes as patients, to trust the definitions when we know that the how many how many editions ago of the DSM was homosexuality considered to be right. a disorder? You know, the, even inside of our own Western civilization, our definitions shift. Uh, you know, th this is hopefully because of better knowledge, better enlightenment, whatever else, but it does not dim diminish the seriousness of illness that needs help. Right. But it's hard for us as people who are sometimes... Um, uh, uh, beneficiaries of the system to fully trust it. Yes, and I think one of the most exciting thing that's happening is all the brain research. I mean, we're actually on the final frontier of understanding how our brains work and how our minds work. This is something that has eluded us through thousands and thousands of years. It's what, 2014, and we're starting to see it. We're, out, we're starting to see scans. We're starting to see how music affects our brains, affects our physical well-being, our emotional, mental, spiritual well-being. It's, I think in the next 20 years, we're going to see a lot of stuff that we made um, assumptions on and we'll have actual scientific data, which is what a lot of the medical profession like. However, I still think that there's a lot you that we can like learn. You say it like it's a bad thing. Okay. <laughs> Paul, Paul, you no, get the last word, Paul. I think people Paul. like Jameson, I think that those people that are doing the early research are onto something. I think that Plato, Aristotle, I think that David Whiteley, people are onto something that's really important and we can't prove it. And so it gets dismissed. So I think that with brain research and the advancement, we're going to understand how everything affects us, not just art. Paul? And, you know? Well, I, as I said at the very beginning, I, I have no authority to speak on mental illness. I think mental illness is actually separate from madness. Madness is a term that we've used for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, mental illness more recently and more specifically. I, when I say it, I mean those transcendental states that Stephen talks about that, that most people who, most people have them periodically in their lives, regardless of what they do, even if there are accountants in this room, and I'm sorry if I've offended you. That's very mean. Um, but, but that it is the tool of the artist. It is the necessary thing that the artist must have. Thank you, Paul. Okay. So I know if I was judging which side I was choose based on some rather nasty comments about my suit, um, uh, I'd come down hard with a Shakespeare slam, um, but <laughs> that I'm going to allow come back you... In. He I is like awfully it. shiny, don't yeah. you think? <laughs> All right. I remember, I actually did compliment you on it when I came. I did, I did just not to them, but The resolution privately. is... <laughs> I liked it. The resolution is, be it resolved, that madness, madness, is an inherent part of the artistic process. Let's go with the pro side first and see, uh, ask you through your cheering and applause whether the pro side won this debate. Uh, everybody seemed to be clapping, but it was tepid. <laughs> Let's see if the vocal minority can carry the day. 
Thoughts on the con side? What is going on here? It's all the same people applauding. <laughs> all right. The that's con the, side the had it. That's the rational mind versus, versus the sick mind. Fighting. Congratulations. We've determined that madness is not, in fact, an inherent part of the artistic yes! process. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I need a job now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're about to go to intermission, and uh, uh, what? Oh, uh, the rope. Oh, there's. Um, can you Hang on, can I'm you coming. just follow the instructions there, will you? Congratulations. You have all won a free ticket to the ARC Ensemble at the Stratford Festival Forum. Get your ticket voucher in the lobby at intermission. All right, you know what it is now? It's intermission, so you can go out, get your voucher, grab a drink, Come back for the second part. There's some fantastic music that you won't want to miss in the second part of this evening. Right now, I want to thank all four of these wonderful people for being part of this debate. Thank you, guys. Bye. -bye. Thank you so much for sticking with us. What an exciting first act of the Shakespeare Slam. What a great start to the 2014 Forum events. Um, I, I was overwhelmed by some of the things that the, uh, those artists and those uh, practitioners of health were saying, and we're going to get a chance to talk to them a little bit later on. So stick with us through this intermission um, uh, 20 minutes. Um, we, we've got a lot of surprises in store for you. First thing I want to talk about really quickly is, is uh, the idea of uh, some of the publications that the Stratford Festival puts out where you can find all of this information. You can find it all on the web if you go to www.stratfordfestival.ca. But publications such as the uh, Visitor's Guide and month by month uh, uh, publications of the forum uh, playbill which is uh, an easy, easy way to kind of guide yourself through those forum um, uh, events when you're coming to the festival. Right now, I'd like to introduce to you Andrea Gammon, our Director of Education, and we're going to talk a little bit about these 200 plus forum events. Andrea, thanks so much for coming out. So welcome. Thank you. Great to so, be here. 200 plus events. Yes. How do we navigate this? It's mind-boggling. Um, well, really, there's events for every type of person, every age, every um, predispensation to how much you want to participate, whether you just want to sit back and have someone speak and be illuminated by a scholar, or whether you want to actually strap on a pair of tap shoes and learn a song and dance number from Crazy For You. So there's all levels of participation geared to all sorts of different ages. And really, to navigate them all, you decide what your level of participation is, and then you pick up a forum calendar, as you've just mentioned, and look at when you're coming, and plan your trip around those dates. Excellent. So let me just stop you there. Can you maybe give us, uh, give our viewers at home just a kind of a, an encapsulation of maybe a couple of things that you're looking forward to? Absolutely. So they start right away in May. Um, one of the first, 
first things up in May, we have David Edgar, who's an incredible British playwright who wrote Pentecost, which we produced a few years ago. He's also done the translation of Mother Courage that we're using this year. So he'll be there speaking to us, and that comes right up in May. That's in May, okay. In yeah. June, I know myself, I'm looking forward to the film festival. Five incredible documentaries uh, from the 24th to the 28th, where you have the screening, and then you have a panel discussion afterwards with some of the uh, um, people that were involved in making the film, or um, people that are involved with uh, healthcare, right? Absolutely. So what about maybe July? Um, in July, everything kicks into high gear. We have everything from uh, concerts by Shalina Kennedy, who's one of our stalwart performers, who is back to sing um, her own material, and also favorites from shows be she's been in, Evita, Jesus Christ Superstar, West Side Story. Um, we've got... Um, Anthony already mentioned Margaret Trudeau coming. We've got Gian Gomeshi coming. We have Richard Kogan, who, on top of being a Juilliard-trained concert pianist, is also a clinical psychiatrist. And he's doing a concert lecture on the music and the mind of George Gershwin, which will be incredible. So I uh, just thank Andrea, thank you so much for being here and, and maybe taking through taking us through a few of those events. Um, I hope you had a good time during the uh, first part of the uh, slam. Absolutely. Excellent. Looking forward to the second act? Definitely. Very good. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to let you go get back to your seat and enjoy your intermission a little bit Pleasure. and we're going to move on. Thank you so much, Andrea. Thank you. So, um, as we say, 200 plus events. Uh, there is something for everyone within the slam. Now, uh, we just saw our debaters um, and I would like to welcome uh, over here uh, uh, a couple of our debaters, one side of the argument. Uh, let's try Paul Gross. And who is your partner during the debate? Lisa? Lisa. Okay, Lisa, would you come Lisa over Brown. here? Excellent. Lisa Brown and Paul Gross. Oh, so. I'm, I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to say that. I'm sorry. I was told to come right after. As soon as the first half was over. Well, we're going to take this I'm half right first, back. okay? I'll be right back. Excellent. All right. How do you think you did? We lost. What? <laughs> we lost. But you know what? Could we, we could you ask the fellows to take the opposite position for one minute? Well, maybe that might be an idea. Wouldn't that be mm -hmm. good? Okay. Listen, I have a couple things to talk to you about quickly, yeah. and Lisa, a couple things to talk to you about. Um, I'm going to give you a quote that, uh, that you gave to, um, I believe, the Globe and Mail um, about this event, okay? It says, the thing that controls you, you have to somehow put in the closet for a little while and then open it up and bring it back. Okay, I'm mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the process of acting. I know that Kurt Vonnegut said the trick to writing for him was to get rid of his big brain, and yet he's got to bring that back at some point because he's got to edit what he's done. How about you on stage? So uh, you, had, you told a really uh, interesting story there about, mm -hmm. uh, about Hamlet. But how does the, how does the artist do that? How, does, how do they control that beast when they let it out of the closet? Well, I think uh, you, you, over time you learn how to use it like any other tool, like your voice, like anything else. You learn how to just kind of shut that big, the governor off so that you can discover things. Otherwise, it is too rational, too cautious, too inhibited. Yeah, that applies to whether you're writing or acting or whatever you're doing. So you want to you want to you want to maintain the the immediacy of the character, be in the moment, mm -hmm. yet ride that line. Sure, and you know if you're in rehearsal, you, you we, we rehearse because it's not just that you learn the lines and figure out where to stand. Because you can do that and practice that and be done in a week. You do it because you have to dive down inside the play, inside right. how if it's Shakespeare, it's bottomless to find out what are the deep feelings in there, what are the deep things, the undercurrents of humanity. And you can't <clears throat> get there purely by your rational mind. There is an irrational nature to, it, to, to that exploration, which then gets reshaped and organized to go back out onto a stage, if that makes any sense. So when I speak of madness, that's what I'm talking about, not mental illness. Right. But they become different, <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> conflated subjects. I always thought this was crazy because I don't, I would never argue that but you mental say illness is temporary, temporarily uh, mentally ill. No, I wouldn't say I was temporarily mentally ill. I would say I was temporarily mad. In the okay. same okay. way okay. that, but some, well, they aren't really. Men, it's mental it's illness is such a loaded bad. thing. Yeah. Lisa, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, Workman Arts and the work that happens there? Uh, yeah, uh, we work with about three, <laughs> 300 artists uh, who work in, and we work in five disciplines in theater, film, music, visual arts, and literary arts. Um, we provide training uh, throughout the year. About 75 programs are, are provided from introduction to master classes. We take our shows nationally, internationally, 
we started a, f a Madness and Arts World Festival that has subsequently gone to Germany and then to Netherlands. We're working on a show right now, Third Eye Looming, which is a fantastic piece that really looks at madness and art, um, a journey through, a journey through madness. Um, now I know we, we were anxious to get to the, your 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 other half here, um, but quickly. Uh, there are huge gaps in your um, stage presence. From 88, 89, all the way to 2000, then to 2011. Mm. Anytime uh, soon that we can expect you back on stage, perhaps? Um, yeah, possibly. I'm sort of talking about a production that would go not mm, 2015, I guess. So I want to thank Lisa and uh, Paul for being here with us. I just have one final thing to do. I would be remiss because everybody in the office has said this. I just have to... Yeah, it's vanilla and shea butter. That's what he smells like. Really? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for being a part of this. Thanks so Enjoy much. the second half. Thanks. Okay, so rolling right along. We're going to bring the second half of this uh, uh, duo out. We're looking for David Goldblum and Stephen Page. David and Stephen, come on in here. Can't come in yet? Thank you so much for Andrew. being here. Hey. Everybody. Okay, so uh, listen. Um, during, uh, during the debate, uh, Lisa just asked me, she said, uh, can you ask them to take a minute and play the other half of the argument? So, can you do 30 seconds on I the other half of the argument? I think we still win. Okay, yeah, but it's, yeah. about, uh, it's really just about power, the, the power of uh, persuasion. <laughs> okay, 30 seconds, go. Other half of the argument. The other half of the argument is indeed some of the arguments I made, which is that there is an intimacy of connection between uh, elements of things that are found in mental illness and elements of things that are found in creativity. But when one takes full flower, when mental illness becomes the dominant force and takes control of someone's life, then it is very difficult for creativity to thrive in that environment. Anything to add? Uh, as David said during the debate to begin with, um, the, you know, in the study you mentioned about Iowa, um, I feel the same way. At, at, at the most extreme moments, you're completely unproductive. Uh, but there are times that the insight that you can have from the struggle uh, can can be very, very uh, useful to an artist. And perhaps there is something that is that is somehow magical of another dimension that, that, that perhaps is somehow tied to mental illness. That's not my area of expertise. Mm -hmm. That could be a spiritual thing. That could be... Um, uh, another dimension of, of uh, our intellect that we don't fully understand that makes us suited to be artists. And that's, uh, that's kind of how I tend to look at it, because I think that the more we look at mental uh, health struggles as uh, something to romanticize, the more dangerous it becomes. I think that the more of the great artists that we have lost to their struggle uh, with um, their own mental health and with substance abuse, uh, I think that if we had held on to those artists, we would have a much richer uh, selection of, 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 of art that would have uh, helped okay. us. Let me, let me dovetail onto that with just one thought, 30 seconds we have, um, and it's a big thought, but there's a stigma. Hence about, the 30 seconds. It's, a, it's about, there's a massive stigma in and around mental health issues in, in I would say, our entire continent. How do we get rid of that stigma so that we can help? Personally, I, I think there are two. There are two factors. I think one of them is depending on what the level of mental health is. Uh, it, for instance, if it's somebody who has a, a, um, a mental health issue that still allows them to, to, to function in the workplace, um, which is or in a in a relationship, those things are are things that uh, obviously they can't be um, excluded from regular life. For um, but what happens is. Sometimes people stigmatize themselves. Right. They'll right. feel such a, a level of guilt and shame and in, uh, inadequacy that the stigma comes from them. The second thing we need, we need people to stand up outside of the arts. Because it's easy right. for an artist to stand up and say, I suffer from mental illness. Because it's kind of allowed in our world. It's because it's romantic. It's not romantic for a CEO on Bay Street to, be, uh, to come out. Because if he did, their share price would go to the floor. And that is where the stigma lies, right. in that. And once... Mm -hmm. Those kinds of people have the ability to come out and help other people 
address their issues, I think we'll be on, on the right track. And just to echo Stephen's point, we know actually from the research evidence on what works to fight stigma, that the single most powerful ingredient is human contact. Right. Human right. contact with people who have been there. Right. We can educate people and they'll do very well on tests. So we can raise a level of literacy without changing attitudes or behavior. And the powerful change agent is people speaking openly and plainly about what is, after all, a really common human experience, despite all the shame, the secrecy, and the stigma. This is really common. And as soon as the discussion gets out in the open, it's hard to close the door on it again. David, uh, Stephen, thank you so much for being here uh, with me. Thank you. Um, I look forward to your, um, your forum event uh, okay. this summer. And Stephen, I'm, I'm hoping to look forward to a single coming up, maybe perhaps this spring? Uh, hopefully this spring, but definitely an album coming out later in the year. Uh, right in the middle of recording it right now. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thanks right. a lot. Enjoy the second half. Thank you. So, uh, welcome. Um, I, I want to take a second here to tell you a little bit about um, the Institute for Canadian Citizenship. It was founded in 2000 by John Ralston Saul, um, and its signature event is the La Fontaine Baldwin Symposium. It's uh, hosted across the country. It showcases leading thinkers using a keynote address and a roundtable discussion. It's an event that creates an inspiring space challenging all Canadians to become part of the national conversation on citizenship, democracy, and the common good. And here with me right now is John Ralston Saul and the Right Honourable Adrian Clarkson, uh, the co-chairs of the Institute, to come have a little bit of a chat with me. Thank you so Hi. much for being a part Hi. of this. Delighted. Um, my first question is to you, John. Um, what are you hoping that this year's audience gains from attending the symposium this year? Well, you know, Robert Lepage is the cutting-edge guy around the world in theater. I mean, is it theater? Is it music? Right. What is it? I mean, we don't even know what it is because he's inventing it on the spot. And so bringing him in to talk about uh, citizenship, uh, belonging, uh, living in a complicated society like Canadian society, that's what all his plays are about. Right. So I think it'll be, a, a, you know, last year was the Chief Justice, it was the um, uh, National Chief, uh, the year before was the Aga Khan, this is a whole other way of looking at it. Excellent. So um, let me just switch to you, uh, Ms. Clark Clarkson. Um, what inspired you to choose Robert Lepage? I mean, I know we, we touched on a little bit here, but I mean, the idea that he is such a, a, a monumental global artist and uh, a Canadian to boot, but what was your thinking behind that? Well, we also thought, this is a man who knows about identities. He's always dealing with identity, multiple identities, uh, the solo, uh, a person can change, change sex, change, change age, and he uh, knows beyond everything what it is to be a Canadian in the sense of of being completely bilingual, uh, able to function in both languages, able to understand all of Canada, and through Canada, he has projected himself onto the world. It's very important for us that we have some, an artist, an artist like him, right. who are able to carry that message to the world, that we are something very interesting and complex, and we aren't just one thing. You know, we're not funny little hewers of wood and drawers of water, of this incredibly sophisticated attitude right. to what, towards what we are, and that's what Robert represents to us. And, and just to add, he yeah. has one other thing which a lot of people forget, which is he's very close to uh, First Nations people. Right. He's done work with them. He lives very close to the Huron, the Wyandots, just near Quebec City. And so that comes into his work as well. And that's a big part of the complexity of who we are. I think I'm looking uh, forward to to him being at the Symposium just because I want to I want to see the, that specific lens that he shines that's right. on the Canadian identity, that's right. right? And I think that's part of what we're all searching for. Uh, I just want to take a second here to thank uh, Madam Clarkson and John Wilson. So thank you so much for being here Great. and enjoy the second half. I think we will. Very Excellent. Much. We've already enjoyed the first. We'll look forward to seeing you in October at the uh, Symposium event. Absolutely. Yes. Great. Take care. Bye. So, ladies and gentlemen, that is our. Uh, um, part of our event. We've got one more person coming up. Um, and uh, I just want to uh, welcome uh, to the stage here. Um, this is Marjorie <laughs> Malpak. Come on over. How are you? I'm well, thank you. How are you doing? I'm great. Excellent. Now, Marjorie is uh, part of the, the Second City. Um, you're a teacher yeah, I'm uh, a faculty of improv. Here. You're uh, mm -hmm. on faculty. You uh, do corporate gigs. Yes. You um, do training. How do you know so I much about me? I know all about you. Okay. Listen, what I'm interested in, what I think what everybody else is interested in knowing at home, is how, does, how is this, uh, your event, which mm -hmm. is called Shakespeare, um, how is this going to work? How are you going to 
oh my God, Alice, go away. Um, how are you going to um, Im improvise Shakespeare? Sure. In well, ambic uh, like yes. Are you going to improvise ambic uh, We are going to learn to talk like this, yeah. <laughs> it's natural for us to talk like this. Okay, so now how do you, so how does the event run then? So it's going to be a uh, few hour class, and what we are going to do is actually practice improvising in the iambic pentameter. It's really easy to do. It actually is the rhythm of our heart. So, of course, it's not as hard or intimidating. We'll work with insults. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to work with imagery, and it's for all levels. I promise you, it's going to make Shakespeare more accessible. So when you actually go and see the shows, you'll feel more aligned with the language. So we shouldn't be frightened of this. Please don't be scared of me, I only bite a little bit. What about uh, what about uh, age ranges? Like, what what do you uh, hope to get in your in your session? Um, any any age range that knows how to read and is interested in uh, taking the words apart, finding some levity in it, making Shakespeare more fun. Okay, Marjorie, uh, have you had a chance to uh, come out to Stratford in the last few years? Oh yeah, I've been a big fan of the shows for years. Since I was a teenager, I've been coming to Stratford Festival, which of course was one or two years ago. Okay. <laughs> What are you looking forward to this season? Um, I can't wait to see Alice. I can't wait to see King Lear. I also can't wait to eat some of the great foods at the restaurants Excellent. in the downtown. Great. Um, so, uh, Marjorie, you want to tell us when your event is? Uh, my event is August 18th, and it's at 10 a.m. And it's called Shakespeare. Uh, Marjorie, thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. Um, did you enjoy your, uh, the first act? The, so your debate? far, but boy, I can't wait for the music. Excellent. Great. So I'll let you get back to your seat Thanks. and enjoy the second half. Good night. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we've got some great entertainment that's happening uh, in the uh, second half. I want to remind you all that these, uh, these 200 plus forum events are taking place right now, starting from this date. This is our kickoff for the forum, and they take place all the way through into October. They're there to help us understand the themes and motifs in the plays. They're there to help us understand our own lives. They're there to make us understand, uh, or enable us to understand uh, little bits of the, what we're going to be seeing on stage. We've got, like I said, two, more than 200 events. Uh, this is just our kickoff. There's something for everyone. Uh, as uh, the playbill comes up, you uh, please take a look at the, um, uh, the online calendar. You can find us at uh, www.shakespearefestival.ca. And uh, we've got, just go to the forum tab, um, or on the main page, you've got everything that comes up is on the calendar. And you'll see things uh, listed on the calendar as to when they're taking place. Um, there is something for everyone. Um, like I said, my, uh, I'm looking forward to the film festival. Uh, it's uh, got some films, some documentaries that are very close to my heart. Uh, Andrea mentioned a few things that she's looking forward to. Anita looked uh, for some things that she's uh, looking forward to. I'm sure there's something out there for everyone. I'm going to hand this right back to the stage right now for an exciting second act. Thanks so much for being with us.